So, once again, I stumbled on this story while researching another topic and could not resist. Anything that makes me say what the hell is worth a swishy dive into a deep puddle. What made me put the brakes on my original story idea and do a sharp 90 degree turn into this story? Well, anything that has a headline about a disabled, bedridden astrologer being accused of murder. Welcome to 1923 Oregon. Arthur Covell was a 46-year-old man who lived with his brother, Dr. Fred Covell, and Fred's wife, Ebba. Along with them were the doctor's two kids from a previous marriage, 16-year-old Alton and 14-year-old Lucille. Arthur lived with the family because he had been in a bad accident a couple of years earlier, which broke his back and left him mostly bedridden. He could move with the aid of crutches, but only a few steps and only backwards. Arthur had been dabbling in astrology for some time, was considered an educated man, and according to those that knew him, he had a strong mental ability. He was considered famous for his skills on the Pacific coast, even reading horoscopes for the Hollywood elite of the day. Obviously unable to work due to his injuries, he made a bit of money with the horoscope reading and was able to contribute to the household this way, along with having written books on astrology. His brother, Dr. Fred, was a chiropractor in Bandon, the primary breadwinner of the house. His nephew and niece from his brother, Fred, were dear to Uncle Arthur as they helped care for him and had been his companions. And then, on September 3rd, 1923, the unthinkable happened. Arthur, from my understanding, contacted Dr. Fred at the office and told him to get home ASAP, that there was something wrong. Once Dr. Fred got home, daughter Lucille broke the news to her dad that his wife, Ebba, had died. At that point in time, nothing untowards was thought, until it appeared that her death was not from natural causes. And as is typical even today, Dr. Fred was the first one suspected and the first one arrested the next evening. October 13th, 1923. So, it's been about five weeks, and now we have two arrests. Uncle Arthur and his nephew, Alton. Surprised? Well, buckle up. The idea that Ebba's death had been from natural causes went out the window, obviously. Now, I saw two conflicting reports about this among newspapers, so I'm going to go on with this one that was reported years later. It appeared that she had a broken neck and also a slight burn on her mouth. Dr. Fred was suspected because not only is he the husband, but, oh, hey, he's a chiropractor, probably has strong hands, and both the sheriff and the coroner immediately thought she had died literally from the hands of Dr. Fred, and so he had been arrested. But then, a Seattle detective, the West Coast answer to Sherlock Holmes, he was called, called Luke S. May, was brought in to investigate the request of the DA, Benjamin Fisher, and investigate he did. The DA ordered a second autopsy, and it was found that Ebba's neck wasn't broken. She had a diet of asphyxiation, which is from nephew Alton covering her face with an ammonia-soaked cloth. Alton was allegedly shown a fake headline by police saying that his uncle Arthur had confessed, and so Alton spilled his guts. Now, it must be said that Alton was not of normal intelligence, according to about every newspaper I read. I don't know in what way he was mentally disabled, but I'm assuming that was the case. He was even committed to a special school, but was allowed to live back at home once his father had married Ebba. Again, Ebba is Alton and Lucille's stepmother. And so with Alton's confession, then Arthur confessed. And that's why they were arrested and indicted by grand jury on first degree murder charges and are held in the county jail. So why is it such a big deal that we talk about how Arthur was an astrologer? Well, you see, kiddos, Arthur read the stars, and they told him that on September 3rd, 11 o'clock, Ebba was to be killed. Well, Uncle Arthur is not fit enough to commit murder himself, obviously. His nephew, again apparently weak of the mind, was allegedly quote-unquote directed or quote-unquote hypnotized to do the dirty deed for Arthur. So Alton, again, only 16, confessed that he killed his stepmother while under his quote-unquote crippled uncle's influence. Alton, hypnotized, crept up behind his stepmother that morning while she was working in the kitchen and took an ammonia-soaked cloth and held it over her face. She smothered to death from the fumes. 
Still hypnotized by the uncle, he carried her to her bed and arranged her clothes to remove any signs of a struggle, and then carried her body to the front porch. He told police that he had no desire to kill anyone. Uncle Arthur confessed that Alton had administered ammonia on Arthur's order. According to Detective May, quote, The uncle owns a typewriter whose type can be changed at will. The type bar on the machine contains a large number of novel keys and lettering. With this machine, the uncle devised a code system for his nephew and wrote out his orders in code. End quote. So what else did our West Coast Sherlock find? Well, amongst Arthur's papers, it appeared that by the end of all things, he had planned to kill nearly 30 people, mostly people in the area where they lived. Initially in mid-October, when the investigation first started, it was only 12 planned murders and arsons, and obviously that number grew quite a bit. By decoding some mysterious horoscopes, May gained evidence that Arthur had planned to kill E.J. Pressy, well-to-do Oregon dairyman, Pressy's wife, and their three children. Detective May said, quote, The motive was to be robbery. Arthur Covell had made Pressy's horoscope and was to direct his 16-year-old nephew to commit the murders when the family was under unfavorable planetary influence. Evidence also has been uncovered in other coded horoscopes, which were to direct the nephew to rob and then kill two merchants in Bandon, Oregon. The plans of Arthur Covell were so minutely detailed that they even called for the removal of windows and doors before the home of the victim was burned. The stolen articles were to be used in a home which the Covells intended to build. Even wills were to be written in advance, turning the money over to the astrologer or his agents. Detective May continued, quote, One will was in the hands of the authorities when I left Marshville, and it was so cleverly drawn up by him that it can hardly be detected as counterfeit. Mrs. Covell apparently had an inkling of previous crimes and of those planned. She had threatened exposure, and the uncle and nephew had decided to get her out of the way. That is the deduction I got after talking with Covell, end quote. As part of the plot, one man was to fall down a flight of stairs and break his neck. Conveniently in his pocket would be a will, which would dictate that half of the property go to Covell. Another family of four would have their house burned down with them in it after they had been drugged and their house burglarized. Five members of another family would be killed by blows to the head, presumably by a family member. These were all supposed to have taken place within the coming year, quote, when the stars were propitious, end quote. All of these were according to Covell's books, codes, and strange symbols. October 15th, 1923, the Evening Star newspaper said, quote, the evil stars under which Arthur Covell was born are with him to the end. A hopeless paralytic, hobbling about bent and gnarled on crutches, Covell spent his pain-wracked hours in study of the occult, determined to make the stars that had frowned on him do his bidding. Today, the astrologer lies in a cell, confessed mastermind in the slaying of his sister-in-law, Mrs. Fred Covell of Bandon. He will be carried into the courtroom in a cot to plead guilty to a charge of first-degree murder. His 16-year-old nephew, Alton, is with him, accused of the actual murder, although he pleads that he committed the deed under the hypnotic spell of his uncle. The dark pseudoscience is run all through Arthur Covell's scheming. Hypnosis, astrology, murder instructions written in a code made up of the signs of the zodiac were his instruments. Fate hailed, marred him. He was determined to match his crooked wits against fortune. He played, but the stars were against him, and he lost on his first throw. End quote. What is interesting to me is that, allegedly, the townspeople where he lived do not actually see him as any kind of weirdo. He was looked upon as a mystic whose opinions were sought after. His closest friends would ask to have their horoscopes analyzed by him. Unfortunately, if Detective May was right, some of those friends could have been murdered if those written out plots had come to fruition. Detective May said, quote, Had that man succeeded, he would have become the arch murderer of the ages. He had at least two programs fully outlined for every murder. If one showed flaws, there was always the other. But his own stars outwitted him. He is through. End quote. So, Uncle Arthur pled guilty but then pled not guilty after a phone call from D.A. Ben Fisher, which, what was said, I don't know. So a jury trial will move forward for sure, but not until November. 
Alton pled not guilty, though he did confess to doing the murder, albeit under the influence of his uncle. So he's definitely going to have a jury trial, but they would be each tried separately. Semi-plot twist. A new theory is abound that Uncle Arthur is really just a disabled man trying to save his nephew and not the mastermind plotter of murders. Perhaps Alton had confessed to Uncle Arthur what he had done in that five weeks between Ebba's death and this point in time. So maybe Uncle Arthur, knowing his nephew was not of sound mind, perhaps he decided to take full responsibility. Authorities are not throwing this theory out just yet. Now, by this point in time, Dr. Fred is out of jail and says that he is standing by his son, Alton, to ensure his son receives a fair trial. Here is the chart that Uncle Arthur created for Ebba. Note the death sign at the bottom. So we're jumping to Uncle Arthur's trial in early November. Dr. Fred testified that he had been called home and his daughter told him that his wife was dead. He had no suspicion that anything untowards had happened until he had been arrested. Defense attorney Giles then went after him during his examination that Dr. Fred was just protecting himself. Lucille, the daughter, testified, quote, Uncle told me it was to be done at 11 o'clock, September 3rd. Uncle Art and Ebba were not very good friends. I don't know why. At 11 o'clock it was time and Alton went in. Uncle Artie said it was time. He meant it was time to kill her. I did not see the ammonia that morning. Alton was in the house 15 or 20 minutes. I heard a lot of scuffling. I would say it lasted about 15 minutes. Alton came out. I don't know what he said. Later on, I went in and helped him put her on the bed. I think Alton went in and washed her face off. I think uncle told him to do it. When I went in, her face was stained. She was dead as far as I know. I did not smell any odors." End quote. Arthur, when asked how he felt about Ebba, said, quote, I cannot say I liked her. End quote. When asked about Lucille's testimony, Arthur said it was a lie and that he had concocted it for her. Supposedly, Detective May had found documentation in the uncle's belongings that actually backed that up. Arthur also says that he did not know how Ebba had died, but that he had taken responsibility so that his niece and nephew would not be blamed. Alton had confessed solely to save his father, Dr. Fred, who was being arrested at that time. Arthur said, quote, the children came to my room after their father had been arrested. They asked me if I thought their father would hang. Alton said that he would take the blame on himself to save his dad. I warned him to go slow, but told him that if the necessity ever came that he could throw all the blame on me. I could not bear to see anything happen to my brother or his children." End quote. Well, that wasn't believed by the jury, and Arthur was found guilty and sentenced to hang. After his sentencing, he ate a light supper and freely chatted, declared his nephew innocent, and was interested in the trial, hoping that a verdict would be reached before Arthur was due to hang. Quote, I am not worried. As long as everything is right in a man's heart, nothing else matters. I think I did right in these circumstances. I firmly believe Alton is not guilty of killing Mrs. Covell. He assumed the guilt because he wanted to shield his father." End quote. Arthur's niece and nephew came to see him and bid farewell. They both broke down speaking with him. Lucille said, quote, I will not let them hang you. I will say that I did it all myself before they hang you. End quote. When asked if he thought Alton would be convicted, he said he wasn't sure because he hadn't done an astrological chart yet. Apparently, Arthur wrote some sort of statement to Deputy Sheriff Malahorn. I guess it had to have been after the trial and sentencing, that all of those murder plans that May found were just simply of Arthur's imagination and not anything that was ever going to be carried out. In his statement, he claimed that he was always interested in the workings of the human mind, particularly as it was directed by the star's influence. His writings were just free rights, and he just wrote his impressions as if they were plans to be carried out. With his accident leaving him mostly bedridden and chair-ridden, he allowed his mind to, quote, to delve and probe into some secret recesses of my nature never before touched or brought to light, end quote. Arthur also said, quote, on reflection, I confess, it looks like my mind had taken on a peculiar mental twist, the extent and character of which I was not fully aware of until now, end quote. He doesn't name names, as it were, but says that, quote, somewhere party or parties, end quote, carry a guilt of the crimes for which he is under sentence of death. This is my own speculation, but I think he was trying to accuse Dr. Fred without actually naming names. 
Arthur states on December 8th, quote, If the stars are right, I will not be executed on December 21st, end quote. True! Oops, sorry, spoiler alert, because I'm about to mention what happened in about a minute. He also believes that he has promised by his horoscope that he will be completely recovered from the effects of his accident, which has kept him bedridden. Well, if you believe you will be whole in the afterlife, I guess that's true. Still in suspense for the last half minute? Well, he was granted a temporary stay of execution on December 10th, so will not be hanged on December 21st. And his desire to know what becomes of Alton will also be true, as Alton's trial was due to start the same day. December 14th, 1923. So again, Alton's sister Lucille's testimony is a mighty big deal here. D.A. Fisher wants the death penalty and believes that Lucille's testimony could get them there. Lucille told the jury how Alton had purchased the bottle of ammonia, how Uncle Arthur had set the date of the murder according to the stars. On that date, her uncle had said, quote, now is the time, end quote. Alton went to the house and returned 15 minutes later, saying, quote, she was pretty strong, end quote, in reference to his stepmother, Ebba. A letter that Alton had written to Lucille was also introduced where he tells her, quote, you little nut, keep your mouth shut, end quote. Defense will say that the uncle hypnotically influenced his quote-unquote subnormal a nephew into carrying out Arthur's wishes. December 15th, 1923. Alton found guilty after only a 45-minute jury deliberation and sentenced to life in prison. Now, remember, he did confess to the murder, even if he was considered mentally unwell. I know now that, of course, they have court appointed psychologists, psychiatrists to evaluate, but he wasn't trying to get off with insanity. And I'm assuming perhaps back then they didn't do these kind of tests ahead of time in consideration of understanding whether or not the accused was mentally well or not. I'll have to research into that. I could be wrong. Anyway, he did not get the death penalty. And perhaps that is because of his mental unwellness and also his age. Remember, he was about 16 at the time of the murder. He'll be held at the same prison as his uncle, but will not be allowed to see him. Arthur is still on his temporary stay of execution and plans to appeal. I couldn't find anything about the appeal in any available newspapers, but I know that as of April 2nd, 1925, yes, we jump about a year and a half, Arthur was sentenced to hang May 22nd, 1925. And on May 22nd, he was hanged and it was brutal. The fall from the noose did not break his neck as normally happens, and basically it took about 30 minutes for him to strangle to death. And for those of you who are curious, like me, Oregon did not stop hanging until 1931. Anywho, very interesting set of circumstances, wasn't it? Uncle Arthur, who did not actually commit the murder physically, was still charged with the murder regardless under the belief that he had somehow influenced his nephew. It kind of reminds me of Charles Manson in a way, in that Manson allegedly never had actually killed anyone, but was still charged with the Tate-LaBianca murders. Manson was always said to have been a hypnotic individual, maybe not literally trying to hypnotize anybody, but there are people who just have that mental pull, don't they? They could be like the Pied Piper and lead people to do things they would never normally do in their right mind. Or was it true that Alton did the murder of his own volition and Uncle Arthur took the blame to save his beloved nephew? I'm struggling right now because I just don't know. If you enjoyed that story, please keep dropping by every week to see what's next. Please like and subscribe. Thank you.